we're back again. Expert interrogations here. How's everybody doing today? We got Ron Dawson in the house. Sorry, guys, for the uh, the delay. We had some technical difficulties there. I believe Ron's at, at WPPI in Las Vegas uh, living it up right now. So how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Uh, I ran all the way over here from the convention center, so it's a good thing we're not on smell vision <laughs> That's right, man. Well, we've got, like, That's Mike... Right. Michael's in Illinois. I'm in Tennessee. Ron's out in Vegas. So we've got kind of we've got about the whole uh, United States covered right now. So uh, guys, since we are a few minutes late, I think we're just going to get right into it. Ron, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ron with Dare Dreamer or what is it, Dare? Dare Dreamer Media. Media. That's right. I was thinking magazine. Dare Dreamer Media, and I should know that. It's embarrassing since Ron and I've known each other so long. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, so. Part of what we do, the format here, is we're going to talk with Ron uh, for about the first half of the show, just about his background and uh, the topics that Ron is very passionate about is uh, branding, blogging, and building a team as it relates to running a successful video production company. So, Ron, let's just dive right in, buddy. Just give us kind of your background, you know, a, a brief background of the, you in the industry and kind of how you started and, and got to where you are now. Sure. Um... Can it, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? I hear you good. Yeah, if you guys will throw up in the chat, is Ron's level okay for you guys? Tom okay, says good. So. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I'll give you the uh, Reader's Digest version of Ron Dawson. Uh, so, uh, I mean, my experience and history in the business, I got a business degree from UC Berkeley, graduated in <laughs> um, then. Sure, Shortly after that, in 1992, I took film and video courses at De Anza College in Cupertino. Did that for two years. That's where I first learned about filmmaking. Um, I did it as a side passion for about uh, 10 years. Um, and then in 2002, I, uh, around two, in 2000, I started working um, for Intuit as a business marketing manager for uh, uh, Quicken. At Intuit, so I was doing like business development, that kind of thing. But I always did these videos on the side for clients and for people, not for clients, but for like my internal team at Intuit, and then for some of my friends. And frequently got comments like, you know, Ron, you're wasting your talent as a filmmaker in this business marketing. You should go out and do film. So um, in January of 2002, I was sitting with a buddy of mine in Los Angeles, who's an independent filmmaker. And he said, uh, so Ron, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, um, you know, I'd really love to make a feature film. And he said, okay, cool, cool. So how are you going to do that at Intuit? And uh, kind of light bulb went off, and I decided uh, that summer to take the plunge. And so in the summer of 2002, I quit my job. I got married. I became a stepdad, and I started a business. <laughs> wow. All in the same time. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend that for people. In terms of you go if you get into business for yourself, but that's how, that's how I did it. Um, and then so I originally started in weddings from about 2002 to 2007. I um, let me see. I did primarily weddings in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, kind of did that as uh, I was kind of geared towards the higher end. So back in that day, I was averaging about five thousand a wedding, which in you know, 2003, 2004 dollars, $2,005 probably by the time I got to that amount. It was definitely on the high end for um, weddings in that area. And then so in 2007, I uh, was having a conversation with uh, Kristen Souders. Some of you may know her as Kristen Asterisk from Bliss Video Productions. She was a good friend of mine. She was like the other high-end uh, wedding filmmaker she was like the primo wedding film, high-end wedding filmmaker in San Francisco. And she and I were friends. We were talking on the phone, and I was asking her, you know, I want to kind of spread my, uh, my exposure. You know, you get these great high-end weddings. How do you do it? And she said she really networks with photographers. And she said one of the places she goes to network with photographers is WPPI. And so she goes there, and she networks. And I said, that's a great idea. And then so I'm going to do that. So in 2007, I decided I was going to go to WPPI Network with Photographers. But I, I always think big. So I, just, I didn't just want to go there 
and meet a few photographers and hopefully get some referrals. I wanted every photographer there to basically see my work. So essentially what I did was I contacted WPVI and I said, I would like to do a recap video for you for free um, and uh, in exchange for, you know, let me put my name on it and everything. And they had never done it before, or maybe in the past they had, but it was really terrible. And other people had approached them for doing it, and they didn't like it. They saw my work. They liked it. So in 2007, I did essentially what was a same week edit. And so with 10,000 photographers, I shot this recap video all by myself, running around the trade show floor. And then I also did like a funny skit, and it was a big hit. And so for the next three years, I kind of was like EWPPI photographer recap guy. I, I, I started that. So like now, there's like 15 video crews here at WPPI shooting skits and shooting recap videos. I can honestly say I was the first. <laughs> so, um, but one thing I realized when I got there was that the photography industry was a completely different industry from what I had been used to. Um, I, at, up to that point, I was only used to WEVA, the Wedding Event Videographers Association, which I think at the time was maybe capping out around 2,000 attendees. Um, so this year, that first year I did PPI was like 10,000 photographers. The next year it was like 11 or 12. And then I saw that is essentially, basically, like it was like the sports industry, okay, in terms of the way these guys got sponsorships. And so at the same time, I was... I had a business coach who was urging me to get out of weddings into commercial work. So in 2007, I made the jump from weddings to commercial work, and over the years, I kind of phased out. And for the first two or three years, my focus was on the professional photography industry. So basically, I was all over the professional photography industry. I was doing videos for WPPI, for Pictage, for Photo Plus Expo. I had a... Um, uh, I was uh, I decided to start a podcast for photographers and this kind of gets to my branding point which is I knew that among photographers I would be seen as the video guy and I didn't want to be seen as the video guy running around shooting with my PD-150 at the time um, I wanted photographers to look up to me and respect me um, for the artist that I was and I knew I was going to do that even as good as my work was I knew that wouldn't be enough so what I did is I started a podcast called F Stop Beyond where I and I kind of coined it as the fresh air of photography so for those of you who are NPR fans um, fresh air with Terry Gross is this really engaging one-on-one um, -on -one conversation between Terry and an artist or somebody and so I wanted my podcast to be fresh air for photographers and instead of asking them a tech questions, I would ask them personal questions. And it got really big, and I interviewed, um, I think I ended up having 100 episodes over, you know, two or some odd years. I interviewed definitely all the biggest names in the wedding industry, but I even got big names in the commercial industry, Vincent LaFerre. This was two years before, you know, Reverie came out, Chase Jarvis, um, uh, Joey L., all these big names. And so... People kind of saw me as the Ira Glass, the Terry Gross, the photography industry, with a little bit of Oprah skin color, right? So when photographers saw me running around the trade show floor, they didn't see the video guy. They saw, that's Ron Dawson from F Stop Beyond. And so that was part of my branding strategy when it came to marketing myself in the photography industry. It was like creating this image for myself that I wasn't the video guy that I was in essence a personality on par with the photographers that they respected and that they looked up to. Um, and then just kind of closing out, I did that for a number of years. In 2008, I moved out from the San Francisco Bay Area to Atlanta. And then in 2010, I kind of changed my focus from sort of like the photography industry focus to um, inspirational and cause-driven work. And um, Ironically, it was because of work I had done for one of my photography clients, which was Pictage. And I had, um, they had a new CEO at the time in 2009. I made a series of short films for them, for him to use as his sort of like um, keynote address opener. And the creation of those films really kind of opened my eyes as to the kind of work I wanted to do. 
And so after doing that, I kind of geared my focus towards doing that. And so now I do a lot of work um, for nonprofit organizations. I still do traditional corporate work. And I still have my foot a little bit in the photography industry, which is why I'm here in WPPI. So that's a little bit longer than I originally expected, but that kind of brings you to where we are today. Rock and roll, rock and roll. Well, hey, I just want to give a quick uh, in interp here. We've got uh, a bunch of people in guest mode. And all you guys in guest mode, if you want to interact in the chat, um, just try to log in, try to try to do that, and then log in. Um, and also the second half of the show, what we really love about expert interrogations is we take questions from you guys, the audience, which you'll use the submit a question button right below Ron. And uh, the last half of the show, we'll be taking your questions and asking him rapid fire uh, so that we can get, you know, get your stuff taken care of. Um, also, we just ask that we, uh, we, we keep it very positive. Uh, that's definitely something that we really encourage. We, we have zero tolerance for, for negative uh, stuff on, on our platform here. So uh, just keep it rocking, keep it positive, and uh, we appreciate everybody being here today. So uh, I'll, I'll roll it back to Chris. All right. So oh, it, it, go ahead, man. Can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Just for the record, I love that you guys, I love that you guys keep it positive. And I, I see there's one guy in the board right now who seems to be a little persnickety. Um, I think that's totally cool. Someone wants to ask tough questions. I'm not afraid of answering tough questions, Andy, Andrew, whatever, wherever you are, because you know. So, because here's my thing. I think there are a lot of people in the industry who who want to put on an, who want to put on airs, and I definitely don't want to do that. I want to share with people what has worked for me, what hasn't worked for me, mistakes I've made in the past, things that I'm you know that I'm trying to do now, directions I'm trying to go in. So. You know, Andy had asked the question, you know, when does success come? Um, success is definitely a relative thing, but we can talk about that. And if there are specific questions that he or anyone has that can really benefit the community, I'm, I'm down for answering them. I'm not afraid. But I'm not afraid of answering tough questions yeah. either. Well, and that's the thing. Like, we're, and we certainly don't mean that we don't like tough questions. And, and Andy, by far, huh. is nowhere close to reaching our threshold of, you know, kicking somebody out of the call. I mean, that, that we just say we we had some we had some guys on previous calls that it kind of starts this way, and then halfway through the call, they're just you know absolutely blasting everybody, and we're just like, okay, you know, if you if you want to do that, there's a couple uh, you know groups on Facebook that that love that kind of stuff, so have at it. But uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, we love the hard questions. It's it's we think it's great. So Andy, definitely, uh, you know, keep them coming, dude. Just uh, just remember that uh, you know, we're, we are definitely trying to keep it positive, uh, but, but certainly not afraid of the hard question. So let's go, let's, let's look at the uh, branding issue, Ron. I mean, I, I know obviously the podcast was a great way to kind of position yourself as you know, the expert in, the, you know, in, in sort of that position of respect within that industry. Break down kind of, right. your, your, a, break down kind of your atypical you know, wedding uh, filmmaker versus corporate filmmaker, I mean, how could how could we use podcasting to to sort of develop that brand similar to what you're doing, or really whatever kind of comments you want to make related to that? Sure. Um, all right. So a few things. One, yeah, definitely not. I'm not suggesting that you start a podcast. Right. Um, it can or definitely something it can help. Yeah. Depending. Right. Right. Um, first of all. You know, obviously there's so much um, out there about um, branding and I think, excuse me, the, um, when I worked at Intuit, I had, you know, the opportunity to work with some of the, you know, the most uh, talented branding minds uh, probably in the country. Uh, Intuit was very, was infamous for raiding the halls of Procter & Gamble, like taking their brand managers and bring them into it. So I got to learn a lot from my managers there. And so I'm sure many of you have probably heard about what branding is and it isn't. You know, branding, to me, branding in a nutshell is what is conveyed to a person, a potential customer or client when they hear your name, when they see your website. What's the feeling experience that you've presented to them? You know, the reason why that Starbucks is able to charge $4 for a cup of coffee that costs them 40 cents to make is because they've created a, a brand around an experience, the Starbucks experience. Um, I'm not a big coffee drinker, but from people who are coffee drinkers have told me that Starbucks coffee ain't all that. So, but why are people paying four or five dollars for a cup? It's because of that branding experience. And 
the number one thing that I would suggest to videographers and filmmakers in order to build a powerful brand is to create uh, a remarkable, unforgettable experience. And that is everything, obviously, from the website that they see, but it goes down to the phone call that you have with them when you talk to them on the phone. How do you answer the phone? Um, what kind of voicemail recording do you have if they, if they get to that? Do they get to voicemail or do they get to a person? How do you interact with them in the, con in the consultation when you're talking to them face-to-face? -face? What's the experience you provide for them when you're on set, whether your set is a... Um, is a wedding or whether your set is a, a is a commercial video shoot. You know, I was just on a shoot last week, and you know, I I like to use a slate in order to, you know in order to have a backup for syncing sound. And you know, I, I edit in Final Cut um, Pro 10, and that has a great way of being able to sync sound. But I always like to have the slate as a backup. And every time I break out the slate, clients like they go crazy, like they think they're on a Hollywood set. And, and I've noticed this phenomenon back when I used to do love stories for weddings. Like, I'd break out the slate, and, like, these clients would turn into children. Like, oh, can I do it? Can I do it? And I, I used to create an ex even when I didn't need the slate. Like, when I was shooting on a PD-150 and there was no need to sync sound, I would still bring a slate because I knew that clients totally got into it and they loved it. And I'd have them say action, cut, and all that kind of stuff. So creating an experience. And I, and I would submit that you can create an experience, whether you're a wedding or a commercial filmmaker. How do you direct your clients? That sort of thing. So that's a huge part of branding. And so for us, when I was doing weddings, that was something big that we did, creating that experience. Um, but I also made a point to kind of look at, at the time I decided to look at the photography industry, because most of the wedding videographers back in the early 2000s, in my opinion, didn't have a strong grasp on good branding, and I saw that a lot of photographers did. So I kind of emulated uh, what they did in terms of how they build their websites, in terms of how they name their company, and that sort of thing. So you know, kind of look to role models as to who is where you want to be and what are they doing uh, to get there. Um, so uh, branding is about like, building experience, and where possible, investing in professionals. You know, we always talk about how we don't want a bride to, you know, do a wedding, do a wedding herself. For all the DIY clients out there who want to save money on doing the photography or the video themselves, um, just because you're artistic doesn't mean you know about design, right? So I see a lot of wedding videographers and filmmakers and commercial videographers who will do their own website because they're artistic yet they don't know anything about color combination, about lines, about design. And so, you know, back in, you know, 2005, 2006, I think 2005, we hired a professional company to give us a logo and a branding design. And um, it was a big chunk of money for us at the time, but it was worth it in terms of building a brand. So to the extent that you can afford it, um, I would uh, hire professionals to help you craft your brand, if that's something that you need to do. Well, like there's so, a long way to answer, but no, no, no. I think that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna drill down a little bit into some of those points that you made, if that's okay. Um, you you've given us a little bit of an idea about hiring a professional to to help with the web design, but do you feel? What are your thoughts about kind of also? Um, you know, there's a thought process that says, well, you know, just hire the pros and let them work, and I think that's cool. But I also know that I've saved a lot of money over the years by learning as much of that process as I can. So I can only so I only hire out the stuff that I really can't do myself, which I'm I'm not a good designer as it relates to that. I'm not right. a good functional organizer as it relates to the web. But I do know how to build pages and edit pages. So I'm not I'm not paying the professional, you know, three years later when they put together the, the design. So what are I mean, what are your, some of your thoughts on the importance of, of learning some of that technical skill? Um, it it kind of depends on what your budget is and what your uh, abilities are. Um, I think one of the things that is important for artists to do is, as much as possible, um, delegate what you don't want to do or what you can't do well. In order of preference, I would say delegate what you can't do well, and then um, and after that, delegate what you don't want to do. And so, 
if you are, let's say, WordPress is very popular. There are a lot of things that themes that come with WordPress, and you can start with a basic foundation that maybe matches what your brand is, and it might not necessarily need a lot of design tweaking. And the little bit of design experience you have may be good enough for what you want to do. You know, especially if you have something that's very minimalist in your design um, in your branding. So. I think to the extent that um, it's not like a mission critical part of your business, it's okay to kind of like do it yourself. But just keep in mind, like the more you do yourself, um, you know, the more you can, the faster you can burn out, or the less effective those parts of your business are. And you know, that's something that I still struggle with too. You know, I'm definitely not an expert at delegating everything that should or needs to be delegated. Cool. So talk us through, you mentioned like the whole experience that somebody has as it relates to the, to the phone call or even to the voicemail. I mean, what can you tell us about that? I mean, what, what should we do? Let's just, break, let's just say from the voicemail standpoint, if we can't answer the phone, what are some things we can do to improve that process? Um, of like the voicemail, like the yeah, if somebody, the greeting? Maybe? Yeah, if somebody calls and, and, and I'm not there, how can I improve? The experience they have just with whatever that recording is. Um, well, one, I would have a process in place so that if you can't answer the phone, well, first of all, ideally I would have a process in place that you or somebody can answer the phone when it rings, ideally, if it rings during business hours. So whether it, you use something like Google Voice, which is free, by the way, that you use as your main business number and then it can forward to your cell phone, or are there any number of other services out there like grasshopper.com, which is sort of like an online voicemail system for small entrepreneurs that will give you the ability to have phones um, forwarded to you, phone calls forwarded to you. But if you can't answer it, you know, having a, you know, a very nice sounding answering machine um, or a greeting saying, you know, thank you for calling, the name of your business, um, sorry we can't get, to you right, get back to you right now, and, and then assure them with when you can get back to them. You know, someone will get back to you within 24 hours. Please leave a message, and we'll get back to you. We really appreciate your business. Something along those lines. If you can't actually answer the phone call when the phone call comes in, uh, and then some reassurance that you will get back to them, and then you know, follow through, live up to what. Excuse me, live up to your promises and follow through. So get back to them within that 24-hour period if you can. Awesome. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I mean, that, that's just, I think that's great because there's so many people that will call even, um, you know, that we're working with in the coaching program. And, and it's like, you know, hey, this is John, you know, I'll call you back. And then that's it. And we're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That, that's the number that's on your website. Yeah. And that's the message. You know, I mean, people, you know, have no idea what you do, how you can help them. I mean, you, you know, you can't, you can't be that way. And so it's kind of an interesting yeah. uh, concept that it, it's amazing that people until they they've been told you know that that you need to do that some people i think they just they just overlook it and don't realize it Absolutely. wow so let's move into uh let's talk a little bit more about the blogging aspect i mean what do you you know what are your thoughts on how you know corporate and wedding filmmakers can and should be using blogging you know to to promote their companies <laughs> Um, so actually, I wanted to make another point about branding okay, before no we get into blogging, and there's actually kind of a similar, they kind of connect for me, and I just wanted to like quickly give an, uh, a case study, if you will, of my own experience in terms of you know, like branding, the kind of step, some of the steps I went through. So I, I kind of rebranded on two levels. One, I rebranded my company, so from Cinematic Studios, which was a primarily wedding company to Dare Dreamer Media, which is primarily commercial work, um, going through the process of um, changing the name, having cinematic studios forward to Dare Dreamer Media, um, creating a message, um, or first of all, I think the first thing I did is I created a website and I had, like for a few weeks up, I had a message on my site saying, you know, cinematic studios is now transitioning to commercial work, and then I created like a weddings only website. Um, and then when I switched to Dare Dreamer Media, kind of doing the same thing. And so I went through the process of changing my brand from Cinematic Studios. And one of the reasons why I even changed the name, even though Cinematic Studios had transitioned to commercial work 
and I had successfully changed my brand from weddings to commercial. I wanted to change, I wanted to get cinematic out of my company name because like everything was becoming cinematic. And you know, it's funny, Michael Gevin, you were talking about Josh Smith. Yeah. Um, frequently people would com confuse Josh's company, which was Cinematic Bride, with my company, Cinematic Studios, because we both did a lot of work at the time in the, for photographers, and we both had cinematic in yeah. our name. And so I wanted to get cinematic out. So that was like a conscious decision I made with regards to branding, um, changing the name. And then and then I went through a branding process for me personally. So um, I for the longest time I was I have been and maybe to some extent I still am, I'm primarily known in the like the the video world and the filmmaking world for my marketing knowledge and my branding knowledge or my social media knowledge. And in two thousand nine I was on Zakuto Film Fellows with uh, Patrick uh, uh, Moreau of Still Motion oh, and uh, Kevin Shahini. Yeah, and Kevin Shahinian. It was summer of 2009, and um, you know, before we started filming, I was really inspired and moved by their passion for their art and what they put into their art. And I was on that show as the business guy. I mean, obviously, you know, when you're up against Kevin and and, and Patrick, I was in there for the beautiful wedding films I had done. I was there to provide sort of like the business voice and. Um, I came away from that experience really wanting to get back to my roots as a filmmaker. So I kind of went through a personal rebranding process where I wanted to move how my colleagues looked at me as being just a social media marketing guy and someone who's film felt, uh, someone's film fellows, someone who um, is a legitimate artist who does work that is worthy to be acknowledged. And so in the process of doing that, I did things like changing my avatar and changing my Facebook profiles and changing my blog from being specifically and exclusively about marketing and branding to being about the art and business of filmmaking and photography. And so, and having a nice balance in my blog between creative work uh, and creative articles and business articles. So, that's part of the branding process is a slow process of changing that perception that people have of you. And I think that's something that people can keep in mind with regards to your own branding process. So you had asked about blogging, so I think that's a good you yeah, know, segue. Sure. Um, you know, my wife and I, Taz, were, we're, I wouldn't say, we were definitely one of the big, one of the earliest proponents of blogging in the event video world for sure. Um, you know, going as far back as 2005, 2006, uh, we were presenting on blogs, and this was back when, you know, a majority of videographers weren't blogging. Blogging was big among photographers already, and it was like an uphill battle to convince event videographers that blogs were worthwhile. They were seen as a fad. They're, you know, it's just something that's not going to be around for a while. And uh, how you can use a blog to really enhance your business was something that was really hard to convince videographers to do. Now everybody and their mother has a blog. So, um, you know, in creating a blog, you really need to think about, you know, like what is the purpose of your blog and who your audience is. I think, I think one of the mistakes that I think I see uh, other uh, videographers and filmmakers do is, like, it's clear that their blog doesn't have a purpose. They almost use it as just sort of like a dumping ground for anything that they've done, any work that they've done, and a way of saying like, oh look, look at my cool video and then tell funny stories or whatnot. And it's almost like they're really not gearing it towards a specific audience. And so I think that's one thing you really need to think about when you want to consider how you can use your blog in order to like promote your business is Who's your audience? Is your audience a bride? If so, how can your blog be positioned and built in such a way that provides real value to them? And so, you know, I would say, you know, in addition to providing just your latest wedding video clips, what are, what are some advice that you can offer brides about, um, about weddings? What kind of guest bloggers can you get on there? Um, like someone like Michelle Loretta from Sage Wedding Pros, let's say to talk about what brides can do for their weddings. Or, or maybe local wedding vendors in your area to guest blog for you so that you're giving them exposure and you're providing real value. 
Um, my blog, Dear Dreamer Mag, is geared towards visual artists. So uh, even when I put my work on it, because I know some of my clients, in fact, since some of my clients are visual artists, I do have clients look at that, but a majority of my blog is about providing education and inspiration. So even when I post my work, I'm always thinking about an, an educational angle. So I don't just want to like post my work. I want to think about, okay, what was some aspect about producing this video that I can change or turn into a teaching opportunity for the majority of readers of my blog who would want to learn how I did that. So again, that's me being um, intentional about who my audience is and how the posting of my work can actually fit into the kind of things that that audience is looking for. Awesome. So, you know, the other thing that you know, I've learned over the years, and Aaron actually made a comment um, in the chat that I'm going to put on the screen. He says, you know, Ron, got to admit, I totally didn't get the blogging thing at first. Now I totally get it, especially with how to use blogging in my business. So I, I think it's it's certainly the kind of thing that when you first start thinking about it as a video professional or, or really anybody that has never done it, it seems like this monumental task. And it's the kind of thing that, I mean, it takes a while for it to work. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Like it's, I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but it took me a solid year of blogging before I started seeing real results in my business. Yeah, it does. And I mean, I've been blogging since 2006, so it, it really, and my blog has even evolved over that time. So yeah, you just got to keep at it, and you have, again, if you have a, a purpose and a reason for why you're doing it, and so you know, you, you, you have, you have to start with the why. I think in any aspect of your business, you start with the why. Like, why am I doing this? For me personally, why am I doing this? Why did I start a business? Did I start a business because I want to shoot video? Did I start a business because I want to make money? Um, I think sometimes filmmakers don't ask that question. So start with the why. And the same thing is for your blogging. Why did you start this blog? Did you start this blog so that you can just show your work? Did you start this blog because, you know, you work be by yourself and you're an extrovert and is your only way to have connection with the outside world. I mean, is it a personal blog? Is it a professional blog? And so when you know your why, you know, every decision you make about that blog um, can be geared towards does it fit into the why. Perfect. The why is so yeah, and, and it takes time, like you said, Chris, it takes time. Well and, and not to mention the SEO benefit, you know, for your website. I mean the search engine optimization. I mean when I started really blogging you know, my result, I mean, my ranking started just flying up from like, pay, I think before I started blogging, I was like page five, you know, for my local uh, video production right. search. And now I'm, you know, number one in a lot of search terms. And, I'm, and I know it's not because I'm some, uh, you know, expert SEO guy. It's just because there's so much more content related to what we do on our website compared to, you know, the competition. So let's segue, yeah. let's segue into the whole concept of building a team as it relates okay. to, you know, a production company. And I'm, and I'm assuming as it relates to maybe how smaller production companies, you know, one, two, three person companies can build a team to be successful. You know, I mean, what's, what, are, what are you thinking along those lines? Yeah, so I think I'm a good example for a lot of you guys out there. Um, you know, I don't have a large company, you know, it's pretty much just me and then subcontractors that I use as I need them. Um, within my area, I have a group of mentees, so I created a mentorship program for people in my area who are interested in learning about the video business. And in exchange for me mentoring them, giving them advice about their art and about the craft of business, they do work for me. So. Um, if you have a certain level of experience where you can actually mentor other people, I would strongly suggest creating a mentorship program and using that as a funnel of getting people to work for you. Um, and it's not working for free. You are giving them something in exchange for them working for you. You are giving them knowledge. And that knowledge is worth something. I mean, imagine if, you know, um, Steven Spielberg came to you and said, how would you like to trail, you know, tell me for six months? Um, would you say to him, I'd be great, Stephen. I charge a you know, I charge a thousand dollars a day. And uh, if you're able to do it that, you know, I'll give you a special discount um, of five hundred dollars a day since you want me to do it for six months. That's of course not, obviously I'm being silly. And if someone like Steven Spielberg came up to you and gave you the opportunity, you would probably pay him 
to be able to do that. And so not saying that we are on that par, but to some extent I'm using that extreme example to make it a point that you are to some extent a Steven Spielberg to someone in your market. Like you have 5, 10, 15, maybe some of you 20 years experience. Don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate the value of that. And there are people who would love to be able to shadow you, follow you, learn from you, and in exchange for that, you have someone who can hold a boom or who can carry equipment or who's good enough to stand behind a, a second camera at, a, at an event or to man a second camera on a commercial shoot. And then as they learn, maybe you can give them something simple to edit as they're learning about your style of, of working. So um, that's one great advice for being able to build a team. Um, and then the other thing is, is networking and building. You know, because of my uh, speaking, like at WPPI and at Weva and other conventions and that sort of thing, and because of my blog, I've created a national uh, following of people who know me. So I'm able to reach out to filmmakers in different metropolitan areas in order to shoot work for me. So I still have a number of clients in the San Francisco Bay Area that I do work for. And I have a staple of a small group of go-to filmmakers that I use. Some I've been using since 2005 um, to do shoot for me. And then they shoot it and they send me the files and I edit it here. But because of the connection to my blog and whatnot, I'm able to find people in New York or Seattle um, to, uh, uh, to shoot for me if I need that. So building a network of trusted people that you can go to, that you know their work, you know their quality, you know them personally, so that you have the ability to not turn down work. Like that was the reason, that was the reason why I even started working with contractors is because, you know, I get double booked for a wedding and I'd be like, well, I got this one job for three thousand. Here's this other client who wants to pay me six thousand. I can. It sucks that I have to give up the six thousand job because I'm already shooting. So you know what? I'd rather hire some other people who I can trust to shoot the six thousand dollar wedding. I pay a little bit more, but then I will edit it. And so that's kind of what got me started to even hiring contractors in the first place. So having a system in place so that you can find them, so that you can hire them, and then having a system in place so that they can do the kind of work that is commiserate with your brand. Like, I can't express how important that is, that you need to be able to make sure that the experience that those contractors provide to your clients, and remember, they're your clients, they're not the contractor's clients, that the experience that they provide is on par on par with what you would provide if you were there yourself. So making sure that they dress a certain way, making sure that they interact a certain way, making sure that they have a certain level of equipment that you may want to use, um, that you may want them to use. So, and then let's say if you have contractors who are gonna edit for you, um, making sure that they have processes in place to edit work that's close to the kind of work that you do. So one of the things that I used to do, especially when I was shooting weddings, I actually put together a manual, an editor, it was an editing guide, it was a PDF, and I would send it to, to anyone who edited for me, and it gave them, kind of walked them through the process that we go through when we edit, how we manage our files, what are the file structure that we use in Final Cut Pro, what's the naming convention that we use. Um, I gave them my philosophy for how and why we edit weddings, the way we edit weddings, so that by the time they read that guide, they had an understanding of what Cinematic Studios was about, and they knew how to go about editing it if they were going to edit a wedding for me. And so having a process in place is one of the most important things you can do if you're going to hire contractors um, and or employees, for that matter. And then lastly, uh, they're called contractors for a reason. Uh, I'm dumbfounded and surprised at the number of times I hear about videographers who hire contractors with no contract. Um, and I don't know if, how many people out there know that, but by law, whoever takes an image or shoots an image, by law, owns the copyright to that image unless there is some contract in place that states otherwise. 
So, so if you hire a contractor to go out and shoot something for you, and you don't have some contract in place saying that the work that they do for you is work for hire and belongs to your studio, they could make a case that the work that they shot is owned by them, and the law would back them up because they're the one who shot it. So um, depending on the state, there may be some things like you know an exchange of money, maybe an applied contract. But it's a good point to know that by law, whoever takes an image or shoots an image owns the copyright to that. So um, have a contract in place that stipulates that you own the image work, that you know how they're going to perform when they're on site, that they are, will not promote their business, they are not there representing their business, they're representing your business, and um, all those things are important when you have when you're working with contractors. That's awesome. So that man just awesome points, guys. We're about to move into the question part of this, where we're going to start queuing up your questions right now. We have eleven in the queue. So if you guys have questions, it's about branding, about blogging, about you know building a team to help your company grow. Get them in now, so we can go ahead and uh, get Ron's answers to those. Michael, you want to drive the the question process? Absolutely. So we appreciate you all being on the call today. Uh, we're going to get that going. Again, anybody in guest mode, if you guys want to interact in the chat or you want to submit a question, you'll do the submit a question right below Ron. And uh, once you do that, you'll be prompted. You can log in via Facebook, Twitter, or a Spreecast account. And you'll be ready to rock and roll. So we're going to do that for the next half hour here. And uh, if you have anything, get it in. And uh, here we go. So we've got SL three productions. I'm unfamiliar with the term recap video. Is that in relation to a wedding? Summarizing the events? Question? Yeah, that's exactly what it is, SL3 production. So uh, I was earlier I was talking about the recap videos for WPPI. Essentially, if you think about a same day edit, you know, where you kind of show the events of the day and you edit a three minute video and you show it at the reception, that's exactly what I did for WPPI. Uh, just, but just spread that over five days. So I, I could get there on a Saturday, shoot the setting up of all the trade show floor and booth stuff, get little snippets of the different presenters throughout the throughout the week, get shots from the parties that they have, that sort of thing. And then the night before the award ceremony, I, I would stay up all night and edit like a three-minute video that they would show at the award ceremony. So, um, yeah, that's a recap video. But it's not. But you don't have to do it all in one week. Like I've done recap videos for Photo Plus Expo, where we shot it over three days, and then we do a recap video, which is a recap of everything that happened, and we deliver it, you know, 30 days later. So it's just a retelling of all the events that happened, shrunk down to three minutes. I can I can tell you I can add that you know one of the ways I got started in doing recap videos is I would get hired to do videos in AV support services for like uh, youth conferences, you know, church youth conferences. Mm -hmm. but they don't really have big budgets, so they're not going to pay you a lot of money, but it's a great way to get in and you can be very creative and you can try some things that you ordinarily wouldn't try if you were under a real deadline or a real contract. Um, and, and that really honed my skill skills to be able, you know, I was, I was telling Michael not too long ago, you know, I was doing same day edits before they were called same day edits you know, as it relates to, to, you know, doing the youth conferences. So if you want to figure out how to do those kind of things for much larger events, and I know Michael does a lot for like Tony Robbins and that kind of thing, that might be a good way to kind of cut your teeth, you know, in, in some of those lower level, you know, youth conference type things before you, you know, try to, you know, make a commitment to do it for something that, that could potentially harm you if it doesn't go the way that you want it to go. Yeah, right. definitely practice. Practice makes perfect on the same day edit style stuff, uh, <laughs> especially if you're not comfortable with moving under pressure very quickly. Um, all right, next question. So another one, SL3 Productions. Uh, at what point did you decide to expand your resources, I, I, camera equipment, etc.? Was it when you emphasis more on corporate shooting? All right, so I'm not – I assume – when he says expand my resources, I mean like get additional equipment and that kind of thing. So um, assuming that's what he means, like when do I decide to get additional equipment? Um, so one of my philosophies that I am like dead set on is not going into debt in order to fund equipment purchases and things of that nature. So my strategy is that I'll rent it until I can buy it. And I decide that I can buy it when I know I have enough projects in the pipeline, clients, 
retainers, that sort of thing, to justify the purchase of a particular piece of equipment. And so that's how I expand my resources. Um, when I have the jobs to justify actually buying it and adding it to my uh, repertoire of equipment. Perfect. And until then, I rent it. Perfect. Uh, let's see here. SL3 Productions. Uh, Mike, I, oh, I know this is sort of off topic. We really like to sample wedding video you shot. What camera did you use when you shot it? Uh, <laughs> I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, I mean, we use all, you know, if that's a tech question, uh, we, we use all 5D Mark III, or Mark, Mark IIs for the most part, a little bit of 7D. So that's what I've shot 99% of my stuff since 2009 <laughs> for, for me. There you go. Uh, Jason San Augustine, rock and roll buddy. Thanks for being on the call. Hey, Ron, why did you move to Atlanta? We moved to Atlanta because it's cheaper than the Bay Area, basically. Uh, my wife was working at Apple Computer. And uh, it was a great job at first, but then it got not so great, and we wanted to move. And we wanted to move to an area where we could have a, le a, a slower pace of life than what was in the Bay Area, um, where we wouldn't have to have, uh, where, where it wouldn't be necessary to have both her income and my income. And for what we were doing and the kind of things that we were doing, um, it would be really difficult to stay in the Bay Area on a self-employment income. And so basically, like when we moved to Atlanta, we had like twice the house for half the rent. Yeah. And the cost of living was just was cheaper. And we knew we wanted to move out of the Bay Area in general. And we kind of settled in on Atlanta specifically just because we had colleagues and friends here. The creative community here was really, was really good. And um, kind of lying our ducks in a row and it kind of worked out. So we we've been here for we've been in Atlanta for a little over four years, and that's a great point we always make on our on our coaching calls is how you know really when someone says I I make this for a project is that good or bad? It's all variable to your whole situation whether you have a wife and five kids or whether or not you live in like you said the Bay Area or Atlanta. You know if you can continue to make the same amount of income in different areas like where I live in the Midwest, I don't need to make what somebody needs to make in New York City to really live well. So that's something that people always kind of yeah. take for granted. Exactly. All right. Leading Thorn. Ron, how do you balance making money, keeping the business going when working with a nonprofit? Typically, they like to milk as much as they can for next to nothing. Have you felt that? How have you felt that? Yeah, I have. Um, well, first of all, there's two kinds of nonprofits. Um, first of all, nonprofit doesn't mean they don't make money, for one. Um, there are some nonprofits that are multi-billion dollar organizations, um, or if not billion dollar, like millions and millions of dollars. You know, you, you think about something like the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Clubs or um, some other large nonprofits, large universities. I mean, technically those are nonprofits. So um, large churches, some of the, you know, we have a number of uh, clients in the Atlanta area that are some of the largest churches in the country. Technically they are nonprofits, but they are far from not having profit, if you know what I mean. So you have this one set of nonprofits who have some purpose behind them that is meaningful, that you do work for, where you can have a healthy budget. And then you have a number of nonprofits that really do not have that much money. So one of my clients, uh, recent, one of my current clients is uh, Peachtree Presbyterian. It's like one of the largest Presbyterian churches uh, in the country, uh, they don't buy. They don't give me an indefinite budget, but I have a healthy budget to do a nice little video series for them. Um, they technically are a nonprofit, and I'll get paid for the what I'm worth for the work I'm going to give to them, and it'll be a nice job. I have another client that is um, called um, uh, Downing Clark Hope Center and Academy. They basically have this home. It's, a, it's really like 25 acres and it's a special organization designed to rescue girls from the sex trade and they don't have a lot of money and you know we did essentially the equivalent of 20,000 15 to 20,000 dollars work of work worth of work for four thousand dollars and I chose to put in that extra amount of work because I was passionate about their mission and what they were doing and um, and so when you go down that route that you 
you do, that is a choice you make. That a lot of clients you come up with are going to be clients who aren't going to have big budgets, and you. And that's why you go back to the why I was saying earlier. Like, why are you doing it? And so, if the reason why you are doing work for nonprofits or whatever is because you really believe in what they're doing, and you want to give your art and your passion in order to help them, um, it may not be the best business decision to have that be your business. It may be. It may make sense to do something else business-wise so that you can do that. Um, not necessarily, but that's just something to keep in mind because there are a number of nonprofits who don't have big budgets. And you may have to go into it with a conscious choice that, you know, this I'm not going to grow a million-dollar business servicing nonprofits. So um, it's, a, it's a balance, but, you know, the, the reward and the fulfillment you get from it um, may make it worthwhile. Rock and roll. Aaron Thomas, fellow insider over at Create. Let's see here, he says, he says, hey Ron, thanks for joining us. Just curious, why did you end the F-Stop and Beyond podcast? Was it because it had accomplished its purpose or was it something else? Um, I ended F-Stop Beyond because I was sort of kind of moving away from doing a lot of stuff in the photography industry, particularly when I came out to Atlanta. And I wanted, basically, I wanted to make connections with other filmmakers um, the way I was making connections with photographers. And uh, so I started crossing the 180, which is my current um, podcast, which essentially is like a filmmaker's version of what F-Stop Beyond was, personal interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with filmmakers. And I wanted to start conversations with filmmakers. So I you know, I kind of f up beyond in its current state, in that state, I kind of have reached its limit for me in terms of what I was getting from it, and I was looking to make those kind of connections with filmmakers. And roll. Right, Travis Wilbur says, I'm good at shooting, but bad at being organized and keeping things on schedule. Any resources for helping creatives with business and stuff? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, any resources for helping creators with business and stuff? Um, there's this really great site called createinsights.com. <laughs> they have some good stuff. You might want to check them out. Um, there's also, uh, you know, I read, you know, I'll joke and say, obviously, what you guys offer is really amazing. So I'm not, I mean, that's kind of like a commercial, but no joking aside, that you guys have really great content for helping businesses do that. So that kind of answers the question, but in addition to that, um, other things to keep in mind, reading a lot. Um, my wife reads a lot, so I kind of read vicariously through her. I don't know if that's possible, but she'll read a lot of stuff um, from different thought leaders like Seth Godin and Daniel Pink, and uh, a lot of the insights she gets, she passes through to me. So if, you, if you're not big into reading, find somebody who is and kind of learning that way. Using other online resources about creatives and business, Creative Live is a great resource for creative professionals to get great insight into business. It's free when you watch it on air, and then you can buy the same recording for a really insignificant amount of time, um, amount of money. That's a great resource. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's so many resources online for businesses, uh, for creative professionals who are bad at the business part. The other thing is partnering with somebody or finding somebody who is good at the business part. So um, Marcus Buckingham, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he, uh, he used to work for the Gallup organization. Now he kind of has his own thing. And he has this great, you guys should look it up. It's called um, Trombone Player Wanted. Do a Google search for Trombone Player Wanted. And it is, first of all, as filmmakers, you'll completely appreciate the production value in it and the storytelling in it. But beyond that, it's a great lesson on doing work that plays to your strengths. So a lot of us think that what our strengths lie in what we're good at. But I'm good at accounting. I have a degree in finance from UC Berkeley. I'm good at accounting. I hate accounting. It drains the life out of me. And so one of the things that Marcus Buckingham talks about is, your strength is not, it's not something you're necessarily good at. It's something that gives you energy. It's something that gives you strength. And so if business, if you're, if you're bad at business, you need, to find, you need to find somebody 
for whom business is a strength. You know, when I worked um, for a software company called Screenplay Systems a while, you know, a number of years back, there was this woman in my department who was my marketing. She, I was director of finance and operations. She was the accounting manager. Um, so she handled all the day-to-day -day accounting stuff. I would say that was her strength. She was like one of these meticulous people who dotted every I, crossed every T. It drove some of the creatives in the company crazy because she was very, but that was her thing. And so you need to find people like that, whether it's in marketing or branding or networking or accounting. Find people who you can bring to your business who can fill those gaps for you so that, because that's really important in any business. And so, um, and you don't necessarily have to pay them. You can come up with creative ways. You know, you're a creative, be creative. Come up with ways in which you can bring those kind of people onto your team. And so that's my answer to that yeah, question. And, and I'll just add a couple really quick things. I mean, you know, we always say on Create, like, one person's pain is someone else's pleasure. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean there's tons of other people who do, you know, do like it. And uh, I'm going to put up one link, guys, too, here real quick. Um, that I found for the books that you guys might enjoy, and I don't even know if either one of you might know about this, it's called Read It uh, me. and uh, what's really cool is these guys have gone through these 500-page books and make these like 12-minute creative video summaries of the book, so you can consume the whole book, the main points, the main topics in like 10 minutes, so it's a cool little site you guys might check out. I also love listening to books like through Audible, uh, which is a good place for books. That's so. awesome. All right, Carl Olson, we had him on last week. Oh. Oh, <laughs> and, and guys, too, if anybody on here, if you guys have experts that you're thinking of that you want to learn from, we'd love to hear about them. Use the Suggest an Expert button above us on, on the call on expertinterrogations.com and just let us know. And then Chris just put in the chat, too, our book list. Chris and I's book list. There's probably more we could add, but there's a, um, a list of books that we enjoy. So Carl's question, what events or associations do you feel are most beneficial for video pros to be a part of? Hmm. I don't know. Honestly, I do not know. I cannot think of anything that I could say are important to be a part of because, I mean, there are a lot of ones out there, WPPI, there's PPA, there are networking associations like BNI. Um, those are things that are all worth looking into in terms of being able to help build your business. I mean, I would say it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Like, are you looking for something that's related um, to building the business side of your business, or are you looking for something that's related to, you know, like, to the creative side of your business? So um, I'd have to think on that one. But like, like, there's nothing that jumps out to me as like this is a key association. I mean, I think if there's a local professional videographer association, that would be a great association to belong to. Uh, I'm a big advocate of PVAs. Um, associations where you can network with colleagues in your area. That's a great way to find people who can help you on jobs or if you want to be just an independent contractor um, and subcontract out to other people, that's a great way for you to get on other people's jobs. So I would probably say that would be my number one thing. If there's a local association like that, um, if there's like a like an editor users group, I know like Final Cut has a lot of users groups, something like that. You know, something where you're networking and connecting with other like-minded people or other people in your in your line of work that you can share ideas from, I think those are good. And then local networking associations. Like I belong to one of the, net, you know, I belong to the local network association in my town. And um, so those are, that, that's what I would say to that. Awesome. All right, Sergio Cardova, what kind of content is considered the most valuable? Uh, I, think, I need more specific I think he, I don't know. I think he posted that back when you were talking about blogging, you know, so in terms oh. of the content to go on the blog. So maybe just talk through some of those options. Okay. Uh, again, it goes back to who's your audience. So, you know, you know, for me, the content that the most the content that's most valuable for me that I'm that I'm seeing is anything that specifically helps my readers with their um, with um, with their creative business. So whether it's, you know, lately, you know, I posted a few blog posts about video compression for the web. It has like, I wouldn't say it's gone viral, but it's really like, it's like totally blown up. 
And, and here's the thing, and I learned this from um, a very popular photographer. Um, his name is Scott Bourne, and uh, he uh, has a huge following, and he started, uh, photo, I think, Photo Talk or some really pop, photo, uh, I can't remember the name of his blog, but uh, Photo Focus, that's it, Photo Focus, a hugely followed blog. And, um, and he's like a multi, multi-millionaire. He, he was one of the first guys to like start podcasting, and he, he sold this podcasting business, and he's really into photography. And so one of the things he taught me, Ron, was about uh, what it means to be an expert and, you know, we were at a Pictage event that I was filming or shooting at, and he asked me some basic video question that I would even never think that anyone would ask about. But to him, it was like eye-opening. It was like this difficult thing. And he said, you know, there's, there's, there are more people out there who don't know as much as you know than there are people who know more than you. And so um, there are topics that I didn't used to blog about because I thought they were too basic. I thought, filmmakers already know this. They're going to, you know. And then after hearing that comment, I would blog about it. And then I'd be shocked at how many, tra how much traffic. Like last week, I posted this three-part series on video compression for the web. It has literally, like, gone gangbusters and how many people are viewing it and whatnot. And so I just kind of learned from that, you know, there are so many people out there who don't, who have so many questions that they're afraid to ask or they're afraid to admit that they don't know it. And sometimes they're basic questions. And then they come across my blog and, they, and they'll and they see some. And I, I even had one filmmaker a while ago even comment that, like, I had posted this blog post about something. And, again, it was a basic, like, a filmmaking one-on-one -on -one thing. And then someone kind of made a comment on my blog about how do I call myself an expert talking about something that's as basic as this. Yeah, it was on a blog post that got a lot of traffic, so I knew there were a lot of people who didn't know that. And so, like, I, I commented to the guy because, you know, I, I'm cool with people asking tough questions or being whatever. And I said, you know, I appreciate your comment. I understand that maybe this topic is basic to you, but believe it or not, there are a lot of people who don't know this. And so for the people out there who don't know, this is helpful. But, you know, if you come across a blog post of mine that's basic to you, then just move on to the next one. So, you know, I've learned that, you know, the kind of things that are uh, valuable are things that help people. And you'd be surprised at how much knowledge you have can help people out there. And so it goes back to who your audience is. So since my audience are visual storytellers, when I post work that helps them in their visual storytelling or helps them in the business, that is most valuable. Can you say just a little bit about the uh, the website layout, video testimonials, reels, photo albums, like those things? I'm assuming that he might also mean too, like what pieces of those things are most important for your website? You know, should you have all of them? You know, which one should you okay. spend the most emphasis on? Okay, so um, I think if it's well, again, I think there's a difference if it's a website, like your static website, versus a blog. So if it's your static website, you want only the best of the best, okay? So um, one thing, you know, you want to have work on there that is the kind of work that you want to be hired for. So, you know, you show what you want to be hired to do. So don't show something that you don't want to do, for one. Two, you show only what you think is the best work. So if something's only marginally okay, you don't put it up there just so that you can have 20 clips instead of 10. Even if you have only one clip, that may be all you need if it's an amazing clip. Like one of the most amazing demo reels I've seen is from, and I can't remember their name right now. Oh, Gnarly Productions out of New England. Uh, definitely some people you should get on expert interrogations if you can. Um, but they have uh, one of the most amazing demo reels I've ever seen. And if that was all they had on their website, that would be enough for them to get and book gigs. There's this Australian filmmaker. She's a female filmmaker out of Australia. She admittedly doesn't know a lot of tech stuff. She put up a little show reel on her website. Her name is Haley Bartholomew. She was recently on Creative Live. And her her she said her show reel has brought her so much business and it's just that one show. I mean she has other clips, 
but that one show where it brought her a lot of business. So it's not quantity, quality. it's uh, quality. Um, as my senior English teacher used to say, I want fudge, not cotton candy. So give them the real <laughs> thick meat, meaty stuff. Um, and then design, you know, what kind of, you know, again, if you're not a designer, get get either like a template that has a design that kind of fits your brand or get someone that you can hire to create a design for you. Um, but design is an extremely important part of your brand. So that is high on the list for your website or blog in terms of content that's valuable, the content that you show, make sure it's the best of the best. Um, and, and then, oh my gosh, make it easy for people to contact you. I can't believe how many times I've actually gone to websites and I cannot find a phone number. I don't even know what city the person is in. Like, how do you not have, I mean, even for search engine optimization, how do you not have the city that you're located in or the cities that you service? So, you know, there should be ideally a phone number and an email link with every web page of your website so that people can easily get to you within one click. That's that's a great good point. <laughs> All right. Well, 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 Ron, here we've got, I think we're going to wrap this up in the next, like, uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, so we've got... <laughs> I can keep going if people want since we started okay. late, but it's up to people. In the okay, line. that's cool. Well, yeah, then that's fine. I mean, we'll try to, I know that Chris might have to leave here soon, too, but we'll still want to wrap it up in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. There's about 10 questions, so I know that's, that's less than a minute of question, but we'll just try to see what they are and go through them and, 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 and rock them out. So. All right. All right. All right, I'll answer. We'll do speed. Speed question. Speed round. Travis Speed round. Wilbur, what sites or methods do you Speed use round. to find crew for a place you have no contacts in? Um, I use my blog, and like I said earlier, yeah. I built up a national network so people kind of know me. So um, I can put stuff out on my blog and, and get people that way. Um, other than that, you can um, contact you know, find a local professional video association in that area, you know, um, use Facebook, you know, there are, you know, there's like a New York videographers Facebook group, there's a Philadelphia videographers Facebook group, so um, join the Facebook group and forums that have people in multiple areas and post something, say, hey, I'm doing a shoot in such and such city, is there anyone out there who can help me out? Awesome. Next question. Google, use the Google. Let's see here. Uh, put... Put on screen, let's see here, you, Bleeding Thorn, you talked about having a mentor or intern. How do you balance investing your time in someone who will ultimately leave in six months with still running your business in a small team? Um, great question. So uh, with my mentorship program, I asked them to commit a year to doing stuff for me. And so and it, my mentorship program is designed in such a way to, to shoot them off into the world, to push them out of the nest and do their own thing. So... Um, I'm not I'm not hung up on creating competition. I know a lot of people are. Um, uh, with that being said, I have been burnt by you know contractors in the past, one in particular, and um, that was a definite learning lesson. But it hasn't kept me from still using them, and I think there are lessons I learned from that particular experience in terms of how I work moving forward. But you know, I have again I have contracts in place if they do work for me where they have client exposure, so I kind of watch that. Um, and remember, the time that they're with you, you're getting value from them. So whether it's them helping you carry equipment or them editing for you, make sure the value that they give you during that six months is worth it. And then when they go, if, you know, if they go after six months, you know, you have people in place to either take their place or you have a process in place where they become a permanent employee maybe. So again, it's all about kind of thinking through the processes of how this person is going to work through your funnel. And, and how you're going to use a mentorship program as a temporary method for you to get additional help in your great business. Great point. Great point. Rock and roll. Loving it, guys. Thank you so much for being on the call today. Thank you guys so much. All right. Sergio Cordova again says, do you consider Craigslist a reliable pool of people to get in contact with? Uh, any other places to build a team? I personally, I personally wouldn't use Craigslist again. Um, uh, just because I've built up rapport with people via social media. Via even Twitter, I mean, you can find people, if you have a strong um, interaction with people on Twitter and Facebook, those are great ways of being able to find people that you know to some extent that you can trust. Um, and so I would go to that before I would use Craigslist. Perfect, perfect. 
All right, let's see here. And 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 SL three, if you're hearing a lag, you might try to refresh. Right, real, quick. A, real quick, is there other question? A, any other places to build a team? Looking at local film schools and design schools and stuff of that nature too. All right. Anybody who having any issues with audio or lag, it's always good to try to refresh. Every once in a while, it's precast lagged up, but for the most part, works great. All right. SL3, what's the elevator pitch you use in landing new clients? Is it different when you meet them in a networking event versus meeting the potential client at their facility? So my typical, my typical elevator pitch is this. My name is Ron Dawson. They ask, hey, so what do you do? Um, if I'm a video producer, you know, even though I've done work for companies like Apple and Kodak and Adobe, um, I'm really passionate about doing cause-driven and inspirational work. So... That's one sentence right there they know, because I've done work for Apple, Kodak, and Adobe, that um, I'm a high caliber filmmaker, but if they, but since they know my passion is inspirational cause driven work, you know, if they work for the, a nonprofit or they belong to a large church, or if they know they're doing this fundraiser for their company and they need sort of like a heartfelt video, I've now planted in them that I do that kind of work. So that's sort of like my elevator pitch. I use at networking meetings, and really that's kind of like wherever I go, that's what I use, um, including, you know, meeting a potential client at their facility. Now, I may tweak it if I'm meeting with someone and they're not a cause-driven or inspirational type of client, you know, they need a more traditional commercial video, then I may lean more on, okay, the kind of work I've done for other larger clients. Perfect, perfect. All right. SL3 again, rock and roll. We appreciate the enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Uh, SL3 says, what channel do you prefer in promoting your business and why? Blog, social media, Twitter, Facebook, website, or other? Um, so I use my blog and social media more for um, a part of my business that, that's actually kind of growing, So, which is like education, so providing education to other visual filmmakers and um, visual storytellers and creating a platform uh, whereby at some point in the future I may want to be able, whether it's providing uh, inspirational content or educational content for them, or whether it's being able to establish myself as an expert among filmmakers and among storytellers so that other people can see, oh, Ron is an expert among storytellers, that means he must know what he's doing. So, I mean, that's, that's been extremely successful for someone like a Philip Bloom or a Still Motion or whatnot. So, that's sort of like, so I don't really... Um, get a lot of clients through my blog because my blog is geared towards something kind of different. So most of my clients are coming from um, networking and word of mouth and then building a list of, like email list of people who I've already done work for and then giving them incentives to talk about me and spread my name out there. And then one of the other things that I plan to do and I want to do is uh, personal work and original content that in and of itself can draw attention to the kind of clients I have, so I want. So that's been a common theme that I've seen in my podcast in talking to successful filmmakers and videographers, that personal work has been a huge um, method for them to get the kind of clients and jobs that they want. So that's one of the things I also plan to do. All right. Hey, Ron, man. I got a jet, buddy. I got a, a thing I got to get to downtown at 5 o'clock. But, dude, stay all day. Stay for like another five hours if you want to, and I might log in after a while. But, dude, I appreciate right. you, man. I'll talk to you soon. Michael, thanks. Guys, I'll talk to you later, okay? But y'all, keep keep enjoying. Take it easy. Rock and roll. Right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. All right, buds. All right, just me and Ron here to finish up. We just got a, a, a few questions here. We appreciate you all staying on. We appreciate yeah. Ron taking the time to do this. Uh, you know, it, it means a lot. This is a big thing we want to do in our industry is, is so many people know the tech know how to shoot, know how to make great videos, but they don't know how to, you know, make a living with it. Or there's so many, you know, just little nooks and crannies of it. So that's what we're here for. It's part of expert interrogations and what we do with also with Create. So let's uh, keep moving here. Got John Azzoni. John says, what's your process for hiring the talented contractors? How do you attract talent? And how do you weed out the ones who wouldn't be the best fit? Um, so I think I've addressed how I attract them. Um, through my blog and interaction, Facebook forums and stuff. I mean, I, get, I attract a lot of people through my blog. And in terms of weeding out someone for the best fit, I mean, a number of contractors I've worked with, particularly in California, are people I've already worked with for a while, so I already have that experience. And then beyond that, it's people who have already made a name for themselves in the industry, and so I already kind of know their work, and I'm in a position where I can reach out to them and say, hey, 
can you do this for me? Um, maybe my position is a little bit different because I have a blog that's 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 heavily followed by other filmmakers. And so if you don't have that, you know, if you're studying the work and you're on those forums with other people and you're seeing, okay, who's really hot in any particular city, then reaching out and connecting with them so that when the time comes and you do need somebody to shoot for you, if they can't do it for you or if you can't afford to hire them to do it for you, they may know somebody. So I've done that as well, too. Well, that's something I want to add to everybody really quickly is, you know, that aspect, like we had Brett Culp on, and he's like, I hired Joe Simon, you know, when I was in Texas not too long ago. And I think sometimes it's not fully the aspect that you even have a connection. Sometimes, honestly, guys, if, if the price is right and you reach out to these people and they're in the town you're going to be shooting or whatever, there's the potential that they're going to help you out. Obviously, building a rapport and a relationship up front is the biggest, uh, you know, advantage, but... Um, you know, not all these people are as unreachable as you may think. Uh, just, just send a send a message. You know, quick hello, introducing yourself. All right, SL3 again. Not sure if the last question went through, but could you elaborate uh, on what you uh, what you offer to folks you like to hire, or even to the intern? I had some folks approach for uh, me for a position and a little bit flumex since I don't have the dollars for it. So I guess, what is your incentives? Uh, for the people that you hire, you know. So, um, so there's two things. One is my, one is my mentorship program. So people who are in that, um, and it's kind of right now. It's kind of waning down. I haven't been doing a lot with them lately, but um, it kind of goes and 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 kind of fluctuates. So that's one process. But when I need someone who really is fully trained in what they're doing, um, I just reach out to them, and then I put in my budget to my client you know, enough to cover whatever that person needs. So if I know I need to pay somebody over here a thousand dollars or eight hundred dollars to be a DP on a job, I'm you know, I'm building that with some profit built in to my proposal to whoever my client is. And so um, a perfect example, there's this one filmmaker in my area who is like amazing. He has his own business. He does amazing work. He shoots on the red. Um, I want him for a DP for this job I pitch. It's a six-figure job. Who knows if I will get it? I don't know. I'm hoping. Um, but uh, I've done, you know, I pitched a smaller fundraising job for this particular client. This client's trying to raise the money to do this big six-figure job. And because I pitched to them to do a smaller job that they can use as a fundraising video, I'm hoping that'll give me the bigger job when it comes through. But part of my budget to them was enough to cover hiring this other DP guy who shoots on a red. So um, connect with people who have the equipment or the skills that you need, find out how much they charge, and then build into your budget proposals profits on top of whatever they charge to your client. I have one quick thing I'll throw at you. If you would suggest for someone who may be more business savvy, how would you suggest if they know how to wheel and deal and get jobs in if they wanted to almost, this is kind of way off the, the course, but almost sell these other people who they know can really rock out the jobs. And that might be a little high level for a guy just starting out anyways, but at the same time, what about some of those guys who know that they could hire somebody for a bigger job, but they don't have that portfolio that's as good as the other person? Does that make sense? Yeah, so there's so many different ways you can approach something like that. Um, you can approach it from the aspect of like an agency, like you're an agent for these other people, and you can create a business around um, being an agent. Like, you know, I have, you, know, you think of a company like Anonymous Content. Um, look them up if you don't know who they are. But they represent all these amazing filmmakers and producers, and they, in essence, manage their careers, and they get jobs and things of that nature. Um, so that's one way you can attack it. But the way I would approach it is, my company is a production agency. I'm a producer, executive producer, director, whatever. But I can be an executive producer role, and I can hire a DP over here, and I can hire a uh, assistant camera over there, and I can hire a color grader over here. And so just like any other film project, it's a collaboration. And as a producer, I can... Maybe I I can be as an executive producer. I can be someone who doesn't shoot, who doesn't edit, who doesn't write. But I have hired everybody. I have built in their rates into my proposal. I have put profit on top of that. I pitch that to the client, and so I bring to the client one funnel. 
They get the whole package, so to speak. They don't need to go out and piecemeal everything. They come to me, and then I, with my connections, bring everybody to the table to give them an amazing product that they use. But my company's name is on that final product. Awesome. Awesome. I believe Thorn. How does your blog post video compression for the web fit in with your marketing to your clients with your blog? So I don't know. He maybe he missed my last uh, uh, answer to this question. So my blog isn't really geared towards the client who hire me to shoot videos. Outside of the photographers who may hire me to do a promotional video for them, my blog is geared towards uh, visual storytellers. And for me, building a platform as an expert in the industry of filmmaking, so that clients who would hire me can see that I'm an expert. Um, other organizations or other magazines may hire me to write for them. You know, I get some of my income comes from writing for other magazines. So if they see that I have this blog that a bunch of filmmakers write, um, uh, that a bunch of filmmakers read, then they then they'll hire me to write for them. So I'm building, my goal is to build a platform of visual storytellers and then at some future point, I currently use that platform to establish myself as an expert, to get writing gigs. Um, personally, it's something I really have a lot of fulfillment doing. I love teaching. I love giving back. So honestly, a big part of my blog is really because I love doing that kind of thing. But the business aspect, the business benefit I get from it is from being having this nationwide network of filmmakers that I can contact if I need someone in a particular city, having myself established as an expert, building a platform that if it continues to grow, I may be able to offer advertising or sponsorships and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, here at WPPI, there are a lot of photographers who are selling lights that they created and they're selling their actions and they have all these other things that they've created because they've built a platform of other photographers who follow them. And that's kind of like what I'm doing. So a year from now, if you see the Ron Dawson super light, then you'll know why <laughs> my blog was successful. That's great. Well, and guys, I want to mention too, oh, the answers we, we've got just a few questions left. Um, you know, guys, these replays, the replay of this call will be available as soon as this call is over. And within a day or two below the call, you'll see a thing that says transcript. And there'll be a list of every single question um, that we talked about in the call. So you can go and you'll see a time code. Oh, I can go to this point in the call and listen to that uh, question. And if you've missed anything or if you had to get, run off and do something or answer a phone call or whatnot, so that's an easy way to you know, be able to figure that out. We'll also have an audio download in the next few days too. So just wanted to throw that in. Um, and if you're on expertinterrogations.com, I just put the link up there. I know some people don't pay attention to the chat during the call at times. So if you're hearing me, if you go on there, that's where that'll be at in case you're on Spreecast here. Um, all right, just a couple more left, Ron. We'll finish this off. Richard Sand says, what is the best approach to scout for contracting other videographers? I think we've kind of addressed that. Yeah. I think I would go to another question. Yep. All right, yeah, and that's, again, back to Richard, you know, perfect example. We're going to have all these questions you can look right through and kind of go through because we've addressed, and I know some of these questions have been sitting in the chat for a while. Uh, there's been a lot here, so. Um, if you've got follow-up, okay. let know. Yeah, let's try to get through them. Let, you know, so let's see. What's your favorite moment in the corporate video production process? Richard New. Um, I really like um, the uh, – it kind of depends on the project. But if it's a project I'm really passionate about, um, I love the I love directing, so being on set and directing. If it's a project I really like, I like that aspect of it. Um, and delivering the final product and having them being wowed. Awesome. Awesome. All right, actually, there's just, uh, let's see, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to this for, uh, for him. Let's see here. Uh, what, let's try this again. So what exactly does iPhone testimonial in 2007 mean? <laughs> sure. So in 2007, one of the photographers that I worked with um, was, a, um, she was sponsored by Apple, and this was right when iPhone was new, and so it was, they were actually experimenting with, um, getting testimonials from people who are using iPhone, which at the time was only out, like this was September of 2007. So one of my filmmakers went around the country interviewing different people who had used the iPhone and kind of getting their experience with the iPhone. And so it was something that was, uh, it was an internal pro it was an internal project that was used in order to see if it would be a viable 
method of being able to sort of like market the icon. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, that, that's actually, uh, that's pretty much going to wrap it up here. So, uh, Ron, we, we appreciate you, uh, we appreciate you being on today, my man, and, and, and thank you for all that you're doing for the, the industry and everything else and, and helping us out here with Create. We know that you've been a, a big supporter of us now. I don't know, I, I, you know, it feels odd doing this, but if you have any, if there's your audience on here and you have any, uh, you know, feedback on Create and how that fits into your people and your model, uh, you know, I could plug ourselves all day, but, you know, coming from somebody else who understands what we've kind of got going on and how that helps, it'd be, be awesome if you, uh, and I'll put the link up here too. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'll also say, you know, you know, if, uh, uh, if you have, like, questions that you weren't able to answer, if you, like, go, if you go to my blog and you, um, sign up for my email list, what I'll do is I'll send out like a follow-up, uh, like in a week or so, I'll send up like a follow-up email blast to everyone saying, you know, you know, here, I'll have a link to like the replay and I'll say if there's questions you won't be able to answer, you can use this email address to send me a personal question. So if you sign up for my email list, the next time I do a, an email blast to my filmmakers and visual storyteller list, I have a special form or something where you can submit a question and I'll go through the process of answering them. Awesome. And we've got um, you, we've got his, his site up here, daydreamermag.com. And, uh, Ron, we'd love to have you, too. Um, I'll mention our final thing here about createinsights.com, what Chris and I do. Um, every sure. single week, you know, we do a coaching call. And right now you can get on free trial. And, and I've had the, the link up there uh, that I just put up in the chat there. Um, you can go and you can check that out and learn more about what that is. And what we're wanting to do is people like Ron and different people – kind of almost a partner, you know, in things here and there with, with helping out and a little bit more involved is even maybe get you on a, a couple of our coaching calls for the last, you know, half hour or hour because we know it's easier to ask questions or answer questions more rapid fire like this than having to respond to 25. If all these people had emailed you all their questions today, you would have never been able to right. email them all. So, yeah, guys, right. we do that every, uh, every single Wednesday. You can get in on our trial uh, for 30 days, free, no credit card. And uh, like I said, we're going to try to get Ron and other experts in there. But Chris and I do a thing just like this on Spreecast. You can ask us any questions. And, uh, you know, it's a very positive place. We try to keep it very positive because we know there's a lot of stuff out there that people get way off topic uh, and aren't helpful. And you can't get your, your business questions answered because we feel there's a big hole in the business side of things with running your video production company. We want to fill that hole. And uh, we're here for you. And if you guys have any experts that you want to suggest, uh, I love reaching the quote-unquote unreachable, and that's from, you know, as Ron mentioned a lot on the call, networking, uh, you know, building relationships with people. So if there's somebody you'd like to see on here um, that we could interview, we'd love your input. Just go to expertinterrogations.com, use the suggested expert um, button up there, and you'll be good to go. So uh, that's all I really got today, guys. We pre appreciate you being on, uh, Ron, and um, that's it, guys. So thank you so much, and we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate uh -huh. it. We'll see ya. All right.